Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to Let's Play Caveman to Cosmos, the first 12,000 years. Now, the last time I did a Caveman to Cosmos Let's Play, I didn't set the initial game um, uh, set up properly. Um, I started in the wrong era at the wrong speed and just didn't really get to take advantage of the mod very well. So I said that I would come back and play the first 12,000 years the right way because that's the thing that really would have made the difference. So this is what this is. I was, well, I'm going to give you a little quick rundown on how to install this mod yourself if you would like. Now, you do need Civ 4 Beyond the Sword uh, installed. One of the great ways to do it is is through Steam, uh, which is where I have the game installed. Of course, I've got this at the wrong resolution here. But there we go. So if you get if you get Civ 4 and Steam, all you need to do is install this base one, the, the Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword, and you can get this through the complete pack, and that's the easiest, cheapest way to get it. It also comes on sale quite often. Once you've got that installed, the next thing you need is the actual mod. The easiest way to find it, as I just always Google Caveman to Cosmos, the number two in there, it brings up the Civ Fanatics thread as the very first thing. This is also a very handy form to go into if you've got any questions of any kind. Assuming it ever loads, there we go. So this is the thread with the version. I am going to be playing on the current version, which is version 19, although when you go and play this, they might be up to a later version, depending on when you watch this video. If you go up to the top here, you can see you can click on the Caveman to Cosmos sort of thor forum thread in general, and you can see lots of uh, lots of conversations going on about it. If you've got any questions, that's the place to go. But if you just want to get it, what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down to where it says the first download here. You're going to click on that. It's going to bring you to a new page. This is part of the Civ Fanatics just download section with all their files. And then you're going to click this download link here or download link here. I think either one works fine. It brings you to yet another page, which is at one of the many sort of game download websites. And then you can pick a server and download and wait. Standard thing. It will give you a zip file. Well, actually, it gives you a 7-zip file. 7-zip, if you don't have it, is highly, highly recommended. I'm not sure if the game also is available in a non-7-zip format, but 7-zip is a very, very good um, file archiving, de-archiving sort of thing. It can read zip files, RAR files, like pretty much any type of compressed file you run into, 7-zip does it. It's free, it's open source, so that's what you want to use to unzip that. It's very good. Um, so yeah, you download it, you unzip it, and then you drop it into your um, your my documents slash my games slash uh, Civ 4 Beyond the Sword slash mods. Okay? My documents slash my games slash Civ 4. It might just be called Beyond the Sword or it might be called Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword or it might be Sid Meier's Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword. You might have to run the game once for the folder to show up. Let me, um, let me pull up. Hold on a sec. Over here. Um, I should have had this window prepped. There we go. So you can see I went I'm I'm in the the documents, my my documents, but in there there's my games beyond the sword. You get this folder and then there's a mods folder and you can see that's where I've put the folder. Okay? And that's where you want to do the same thing. If you don't have this my games beyond the sword set up yet, just run the game once. It should create all those folders for you and then just drop it into the mods. Then once you're in the game, you can load a mod through, this is the main menu. Now you're in, normally when you run the game, you get a different main menu for Civ 4, uh, but one of the options will be advanced, and then there'll be an option to load a mod, and then you'll be able to pick Caveman to Cosmos from there, and then after load, uh, and it does take a little while to load because it's a very big mod, you'll be brought back to this main menu, and now you're ready to play the game. Now, when you go and you want to play a game, you go into single player. Now, you might be used to hitting play now, uh, which quickly sets up a game using some default settings. However, those default settings are not appropriate for Caveman to Cosmos. You really want to go into custom game and really fine tune what you're going to get. So we're going to go into that right now. Now, some of the settings are things that I've sort of like figured out myself, but also uh, come highly recommended by some of the people involved with the mod themselves, including is Hydromancer X? I should have had this up here. Uh, I feel bad that I don't have his name handy. Um, he's very, very active on my channel. 
Yeah, Hydromancer X. I did get it right. Excellent. He's one of the modders for the game. He's also a very big advocate for the game and continues to encourage me to play. Uh, so, you know, shout-outs to him. Also for letting me know exactly what settings I should really be looking at. So, uh, above here you've got your standard civilization picking. There are quite a few more options than before. Uh, there's some more leaders, some more nations. Um, and we're just going to leave it random here for this example. Your difficulty setting. Now, if you are used to playing Civ 4, you probably want to drop the difficulty by one setting at the very least because things are very different in this game and as you're relearning everything, uh, it may be a challenge. Like, I normally play Civ 4. I think Monarch, uh, sometimes I play Emperor, especially if I've got a, if I'm picking a really strong civilization. Um, but I've, I've been playing this on Prince and still finding it to be a little bit of a challenge. The map you want to use is C2C Perfect World 2F. Okay, there's a perfect world, but you want to use perfect world 2F. It creates a very, very nice, very realistic world. Ultimately, you need to make sure you're using one of these C2C maps, which are the only options available here, because these are the ones that have the right resources. Um, and you can you can really choose possibly just about anything, but perfect world 2F is the one that's really optimal. Now, the map is quite a bit more complex than the normal vanilla version of Civ, so you don't want to go too, too big, because... It can, it can crush your computer. It can stop the game from running, um, especially in the later phases, because it's very complicated. So you actually want to trim it down. In fact, for this demo, um, because I'm not going to be conquering the whole world, I'm just going to use small, just to sort of minimize the, uh, the, the process and time to generate the map and to play. Uh, sea level is up to you. Medium tends to work fine. Era. This is extraordinarily important, and this is what I screwed up last time. You absolutely have to pick prehistoric to get the proper experience. And this is a new era. Your computer will probably default to Ancient, which is the normal start of the game in normal Civ 4, but they've added a new era called prehistoric. You want to pick that for sure. You should also set your speed to Snail. Um, and, you know, these are slower, slower speeds. Basically, it takes many more turns to get something done. It doesn't mean the game itself will necessarily take much longer to play through, simply because if all you're doing is building stuff, you're mostly just skipping a lot of turns in a row. Um, so Snail doesn't, doesn't add that much to the overall length of the game, necessarily. Um, but it balances out the, the... The game is balanced... The mod, rather, is balanced to be played at snail pace. Um, it does mean that battles, wars do um, take less time, basically. Take less actual sort of years, uh, and it's slightly more re realistic that way. You get a lot more use out of your units at every time period, and just you basically just get a more of an experience at each time period. You're not, you're not just going through things really quickly. Um, you can start anywhere. Uh, the recommendation that I got from Hydrancer X is to start in the old world because more civs will be there, so you'll get more contact with people, which will make the early game a little bit more interesting just because you'll have more neighbors and more stuff to do. Uh, this part doesn't matter so much, although I like Break Pangeas because I do like multiple continents. And Cylindrical Map Wrap is your, is your default option, which is if you keep going east far enough, eventually you'll loop around to the west. Um, and that's kind of what you would expect. Now, uh, the options now are very, very important. It is recommended you turn off all the victory conditions except for mastery. Mastery is basically a combination of all victories together. You get a certain number of points for accomplishing various uh, tasks. Based on the amount of land you get, you have a certain number of points. If you are the person first launched to space, you get a certain number of points, and so on and so forth. Um, but you kind of have to play through the whole thing. And it also means if someone does like some sort of wacky, uh, you know, builds the UN, gets some sort of crazy diplomatic victory, and s despite the fact that you own 60% of the world or something like that, you're not like screwed. I mean, that might be a bad example. Religious might be a better example. Or space race. Like you've taken over everything. You've done everything. You were a turn away from winning culturally, I don't know, and then someone just like builds a spaceship. It's kind of cheap. And it also means you as a player can't cheap out, you know. Uh, you're about to be crushed soon, but you're going to fire off your spaceship and then win that way through cheese. Mastery requires that you do good sort of in general. Now, the specific options, I'm going to skip through everything that's not selected. It's, it's recommended. Some of these existed in the original, the vanilla sieve, um, and then some of them are new to this game. Uh, so I'm just going to scroll down here to the stuff you want on. Now, we're going to start with start as a minor sieve. I think this was strongly recommended as, yes, you should play like this, if you are a little less comfortable with the gameplay, you may want to turn this off. What a minor sieve means is that until 
you discover writing, it's literally impossible to to uh, conduct any diplomacy whatsoever, and you're just at war with everyone you meet. Um, basically, basically, you guys are all barbarians at this point. Um, you know, you meet someone else out there who's not from your tribe, you're going to try to kill them as a self-defense thing. It's it's fairly un understandable and probably appropriate and, and realistic simulation of the sort of experience at the time. Uh, but it obviously increased the difficulty level a fair bit. However, what it means really is that the early game is just as exciting as the mid or late game. Uh, you're not just sort of playing the expansion game. You're not yeah. You're not just pushing out uh, peacefully before everyone's got an army because as soon as you meet someone you could die. So you need to worry about your military right then. You're going to be involved in border skirmishes right from the beginning. You can go in and steal their workers right from the beginning. And then at some point you guys discover writing and hopefully you settle down and work out your differences. It does mean there's a funny little quirk that the more you explore, the more people you will find, the more people you'll be at war with, and the harder diplomacy will be later on. And to a certain extent, turtling up early on and not exploring too much means you'll meet fewer people, and then if you don't meet them until after you discover writing, then it'll be that much easier to stay at peace. In practice, you will more or less end up meeting most of the people on your continent at some point before writing. So it's a little bit of a moot point. So it makes a much more exciting early game. Anyway, I'm going to leave it on for this. Multiple production is very, very important. Uh, because uh, this is something that could have come up in regular Civ as well. But in, in this game, because of the way certain things scale up and because of time scales and things like that, it's definitely possible for you to have enough production to build more than one thing in a single turn. And enabling this means that that's what will happen. Instead of everything going into overflow, and so at some point you get too much overflow so it converts to money, that makes no sense. If you can build, if you can actually build two archers per turn, build two archers per turn. That's what this enables. Multiple research does the same thing for research, and it's important just because the, te the tech tree is so deep now, and if you're sort of beelining kind of in one portion of the tech tree, it's possible that at some point you're gonna be like, okay, I've gotta fill in this other branch I never explored, but half the techs in there, you know, you're, you're at this point you're generating, I don't know, 100 beakers per turn, but the techs only cost like 20 beakers each. And so if you turn on multiple research, it'll let you like quickly grab five of these super cheap research techs instantly in one turn. And since a turn represents many, many, many years, especially early on, it's certainly reasonable that that happens. And this is only happens in edge cases where uh, you are backfilling in some really old technology that should be really easy for you to pick up anyway, so it's useful. Usable mountains is a really interesting feature. Um, so normally in Civ, the mountains, you just can't pass them, but you can't walk through them, you can't do anything with them. Caveman to Cosmos adds the ability to do, do stuff with mountains, um, like build certain types of... Um, uh, it can get resources, and you can use those resources, and some units can go through mountains, uh, that sort of thing. It becomes a normal tile. Uh, you can't walk through them initially, uh, but eventually become usable. It's a nice feature. Surround and destroy is not necessarily critical uh, to the gameplay, but it means if you're surrounding an enemy troop or city, you get a bonus to combat, which is realistic. You get some sort of flanking bonus. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, on and off won't change your experience too much, but on seems better. Advanced diplomacy is good. Uh, you get some new trading options like trading military units and worker units and also opening embassies with other nations. It doesn't radically transform the game, but it does add more depth to diplomacy and Civ 4 has always been good in diplomacy, so it's a good idea. Unlimited wonders, there is a cap to the number of wonders you can build in a single city, um, which is probably good for game balance, but you can turn that off if you, if you don't want that. Um, if you're doing some sort of one city challenge, you may need to do this, uh, but there's also, there is a one city challenge checkbox from Vanilla Civ. I don't know if that will automatically implement this or not, in because this checkbox is from Caveman to Cosmos. So if you're doing one city, you probably want to check it just to make sure. Barbarian generals are interesting. It means that um, barbarians can get great generals themselves and be that much more dangerous. However, it means that you will also be able to gain XP and great generals from fighting with barbarians. Whereas normally, um, for balance, they, they turn that off because there's quite a lot more th units in this game that sort of count as, as barbarians. Um, so you could farm them quite easily for XP and stuff. So you want this on because you want to be able to farm them for XP and things, and this sort of counterbalances it out. Assimilation is really interesting. Um, it means that 
So civilizations have unique units and unique buildings. Well, a simulation means if you conquer a, a city from another civ, that city will actually be able to build the unique units of that civ rather than your own. Um, and it's just kind of a fun and interesting mechanic, and I like it. Um, final five we're going to leave off. Uh, you, can, you can read the mouse over in-game to see what it does. Actually, we're going to skip through a few of these and bring up Great Commanders. Now, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with Great Commanders yet, but what it does is it gives extra depth to your Great Generals and is apparently a very nice feature to add in. Culture Link starts. It doesn't really do much mechanically, uh, but it's interesting flavor-wise in that um, after the map is generated, it will swap civilizations around so that civilizations that existed near each other in the real world will exist near each other in Civ. Uh, this will probably come up more on a bigger map with more players, um, because on a smaller map with small, fewer players, there's just sort of the odds of having people that are, are of the same uh, culture group are somewhat reduced. But, you know, if you have enough people, then if you're playing as France, then you'll start near England and Germany, for example, um, which is fine. Again, it doesn't actually change the gameplay, except that maybe it changes who you're going to face, um, but it's not the end of the world. Personalized map, I used this in my last Let's Play, and I actually don't like it. I find that it clutters things up. It's, it's kind of interesting that it names features like mountains and bays and things, but I found it cluttered up my map too much, and I didn't like it. Advanced Economy is really good, apparently. Uh, I've been using it. I'm, I'm a little unsure. I can't really define exactly what it adds, but it adds a lot more depth of economic fa factors, and... That's why we have this mod, because this mod is like super realistic. Real realistic culture spread is interesting. Instead of just like, you know, you reach a certain threshold of culture in your city and all the borders expand by one, uh, this will just sort of expand kind of one tile at a time-ish, and it will follow natural features like flat areas, rivers, uh, whereas mountains kind of block the culture spread quite a bit more. Um, I I'm not sure. It, it feels like it means the culture spreads a little slower. Um, but that might not be the case. You might get more frequent culture pops, uh, but just each pop gets you a little bit less. Um, but it seems to feel right, so I may as well leave it on. Larger cities, I was playing with this on. Uh, Hydromancer X suggested leaving this off. It wasn't in his list of things to, in to leave on, um, which I'm kind of curious about. I'm going to have to ask him about it at some point. Maybe he'll comment on this video. Um, but I qu thought it was quite interesting that once cities got really, really big, they could actually work out to three levels of tiles and grow to be very, very large. Uh, but maybe there's a balance problem with it, or maybe, to be honest, it was a little weird placing my cities uh, early on because I was keeping this three tile radius in mind when placing cities because they didn't want them to overlap. But the three tile thing happens so late in gameplay. Um, that for most of the game, you're sort of just wasting space. So by leaving it off, you're avoiding that particular problem. Um, I don't know. Well, it'd be interesting to get some feedback about this. Realistic co corporations... I gotta check this thread. I thought... I thought that was one he wanted turned on. Let me see. Where is my thread? Um, because I was asking questions about... Um, Neanderthals. Here we go. And he's emailed me this list of suggestions a few times. So I was asking about Neanderthals, because Neanderthals in previous versions of the game were quite rough. And apparently they've been toned down, which is very nice. Um, yeah, it's not in his list of recommended picks. Huh. Now there's modern corporations, but not realistic corporations. We'll have to see about what this does. Religion Decay is very good. This actually, I didn't have this on last game and I was very disappointed with it. Um, there are quite a bit more religions in this game. It's instead of seven, we've got like 27 or something like that. Um, and there simply, there starts to be kind of like a clutter of religions at some point. So this way, religions that are less popular, which I take to mean maybe ones that haven't spread as much, but also ones that haven't been adopted as state religions, will potentially fade away, which I think is, is A, realistic, um, you know, like some religions that were very popular way back in the day are not so popular anymore, you know, like Kemetism, like the, the, the Egyptian religion, the Greek religion, um, like the Greek mythology type religion, um, have faded away. And so I think it's realistic that that happens. Uh, and 
just in terms of clutter, it was really good. Because this way you can have a game that has a lot of different religions in it without actually dealing with a lot of different religions of that game. So they'll fine-tune themselves very, very good. Barbarians Always Raised was recommended to have on as opposed to them claiming the city. I think that's probably fine. United Nations. Normally, if the diplomatic victory is turned off, you cannot build the UN or Apostolic Palace. Apostolic Palace is for religious victory. Um, turning this on allows it to still exist, and then you can still have elections and do various votes. You just can't win directly through it, so it's a good one to have. Advanced espionage are more espionage uh, options, which is kind of cool. Guilds are like early corporations, and I, I last game they were sort of just auto spreading and I wasn't really involved with them but it's one of the things I really want to look at playing the game on a slower speed will let me really see those modern corporation also I likes advanced nukes well we nuked the last game and I think I had advanced nukes turned on but I don't think I really I really got what it was doing for us um, but it is this I was playing in version 16 or 17 actually I may have been playing in like version 14 so a lot of things may have changed since then and we're going to leave the others off no, f oh, um, no city limits from civics. Uh, by default, your civics limit how many cities you can have for a while. Like your very first civic is like three cities, then it goes up to six. Uh, maybe scaled by map size. Um, so this would turn that aspect off. I actually think it's quite a good idea. That way, it prevents you from spamming things too quickly. Mostly, it's, even if you turn this off, instability and such would limit it. Um, but frankly, I like it as kind of like a hint as to don't expand any faster than this because you might get screwed. Fixed borders is actually a really neat mechanic. Um, basically, there's at a certain point you get certain government civics or whatever that, that turns on fixed borders and at that point people can't sort of push your borders via culture anymore. Culture will still expand your borders into emptiness but People can't steal your tiles via culture, which sort of represents a state in human development where people of different nations sit down and, and agree. They draw lines and say, here's the border. And they don't, it doesn't just move randomly. Um, but of course, you can still go to war. You can still take territory through a variety of means. You can, if you take a city, you will take, uh, you will take the land around it. Um, you can also send military units out to stand on a tile and then claim that tile in the name of your nation, which I like quite a bit. In fact, you can do that even if you don't have fixed borders turned on, um, but I think it, it fades away as, as once your unit moves. But if you stay in that square, it'll stay claimed. And I think with fixed borders turned on, it'll just stay claimed permanently. Anyway, those were all the options. I'm going to stop this video right here, and I will be right back with us in the game.